This is Mia Musso, and she's the daughter of Doug and Danielle. And that worship thing, it kind of flows through the Musso house, doesn't it? Mia said, look, I wanted the church to hear because I know we we were able to sing this at Unplugged. And how many of you were at Unplugged that worship night a couple of weeks ago? That's awesome. I I wanted the church to hear, and you're, you're 17 years old, 17 years old, a senior in high school. Okay, young. 
but full of the Spirit of God. She wrote this song. This song is on our latest album, Come Close, which is just loaded with amazing songs. You wrote this song, and I wanted you to take a moment to tell the church how it was birthed, threshing floor. Tell, tell us what God did in you to really script this song. Okay, well, um, I first heard of the threshing floor in a few series we did, like in January, I think. But um, uh, we were talking about the threshing floor, and I never heard it like in a very like, detailed way, but... When they were talking about it, it kind of just like, just, I liked the way it sounded, the threshing floor, and so I was like, oh, that's cool. And so um, a couple months later, it was like Easter, and there was like things in my life God, that just were not supposed to be there, that were not of God, that I was just keeping for myself. And um, it, was, it was Easter, and I finally just surrendered that to God, and He just started showing up in my life, and every, everything that I did, my work, my school, my friends, like He just started showing up. And as soon as I surrendered that, I could just see him, like his glory in my life. And then two weeks after that, I started riding the threshing floor. And um, that's basically how it is. Strong, strong. Mia, let me ask you this. What, tell us what's in your heart when, when you're singing threshing floor. And I know that was birthed in a real personal way for you. What's your heart for this house as you're singing that and declaring that over the HPC family? What, what would you want us to walk away with? I guess... Um, there's no, nothing that you could ever do that God cannot save you from. That Come He on. is the Redeemer. He, mm. he can redeem anything that's inside of you. I know a lot of times you may think that you're just too far gone, that you've just done things that you, that you don't think that God can save, but I want you to know that God wants to save you. He, 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 that's what He looks forward to. He loves to come and save you and take away your sin, Amen. and that's just... Amen. Amen. How many of you sense the touch of God on this young lady's life? you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 3. I want to teach you today on the threshing floor. I just felt like that song we sang, it's got so much to it. We, we have worshipped the Lord through that song across all of our campuses today. And how many of you have ever listened to a song and it just grabbed a hold of your spirit? How many has ever just had a moment with God uh, in a worship song and it, it just wrecked you? Anybody just snotting and slobbering in a, over a, 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 an encounter with God? When I first heard this song, I just wept. I mean, it felt like the tangible presence of God just walked into my kitchen, stopped me from eating my scrambled eggs. Spirit of God just wrapped his arms around me. I, I've been studying what is the threshing floor? What, what is a threshing floor? You know, it's kind of an ancient concept. It's very popular in biblical text, but in, in the modern era, we don't really know. It's, it's kind of unfamiliar with modern machinery and with farming techniques that are so different today. What's the significance of a threshing floor? What is a threshing floor? I thought it'd be good to maybe show you a picture Okay, so I Googled a picture, and here's what I found. There's not a lot of good pictures out there, but this was the best that I could find. A threshing floor is a flat area where harvested grain is spread out, it's threshed, and then it's separated from the chaff. Okay, this was an important part of biblical culture because most of the communities and villages in ancient days, they were uh, farming, farming communities, and it was the source of bread. It was the source of sustenance and how they fed their families. This threshing was really it, it, separating the wheat from the chaff. It, it really required two different things. There's, when we say threshing, it's taking grain that's harvested and it's spreading it out on that threshing floor, and then there's a crushing process that has to take place. You would either, uh, with farm animals or with an instrument called a flail, you would thresh that grain to break apart the edible from the unedible. There was some parts that were useful, and then there was this thing called the chaff or the husk that the grain was in. You, you didn't need the husk. You were trying to get the grain. If you were going to make bread, you had to separate the wheat from the chaff. Can I have a good Amen. And so they would thresh, it was this process of threshing 
on this flat surface called a threshing floor. Once they crushed that harvested grain and they had this mixture of chaff and wheat, then they would take a winnowing fork, a winnow, a winnowing fork, like a rake-like substance, and they would scoop that mixture up and they would throw it up in the air. And the, the wind would come and blow the chaff away, that, that which wasn't edible, the, the thing you were trying to get rid of. The wind would blow the chaff away, but the grain was heavier and it would fall to the ground. And it was this process of crushing and then winnowing. Crushing and winnowing to get to the grain that was useful. Now, there's, there's such a symbolic, there's a scriptural priority and purpose. The reason why this song that we sang today is so powerful, uh, the, the threshing floor is mentioned all throughout Scripture. And I want to do my best to give you four different windows into why the threshing floor is so important and let you know that God does some significant things when we're on the threshing floor. This process of crushing and separating and, 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 and redeeming what's useful. All of us are going through in some way, shape, or form the threshing process. If you're taking notes, I want you to see this. Number one, the threshing floor is a place of refinement. A place of refinement. Look at this scripture in Luke chapter 3. Luke 3, 16, the Bible says this. Uh, John the Baptist is speaking here, and he answers their questions by saying this. I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. He's so much greater, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, John the Baptist is talking of Jesus. John had a powerful earthly ministry, and many asked him if he was the Messiah, and he said, no, I'm a forerunner. There's someone coming after me who is greater than I am. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Come on, how many know we need the help of the Holy Spirit? He says, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, notice what he says in verse 17. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Okay, this is the, the threshing process I just described to you is the same picture that John the Baptist gives speaking of Jesus. He said Jesus is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. Mm-mm-mm. Now, now, here's why this is significant. The threshing floor is the process by which you separate that which is useful from that which is useless. How many of you know that sometimes our lives are a mixture of things? We have things in our lives that are very valuable, and there are things that, that are very kingdom purposeful, but then we have some things that need to be eliminated. Can I have a good amen? Amen. And I think the threshing process is, is the process that God brings us through to help us be more like Jesus. When we say that there's crushing on the threshing floor, how many know that's not always pleasant? That's not always fun. Come on, Pastor Mike, can we talk about the fun things in church on Sunday? How many have ever been through a season of crushing? And sometimes there's a lot of questions that come with the crushing. I thought about a you know, particular season in my life when I was in college. Uh, I, I don't know how, what your journey was like, but when I was in college, I was kind of all about myself. I was on the Haman train. Choo-choo! All aboard! Man, just living for myself, my dreams, my visions, my desires. It was my plans. How many know God has to eliminate some things? Sometimes we live as if our entire life is about us, but we never discover our purpose until we know it's not about me. And man, when I was in college, God brought me through a crushing process. It was painful. Uh, looking back at it, I'm grateful for it, but while I'm walking through it, I didn't like it. Am I talking to anybody this morning? 
Maybe some of you are being crushed by things that are happening in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your finances, with one of your children. You feel like you are being crushed to pieces. And sometimes we can question, God, where are you when I'm being crushed? And the Lord says, I'm bringing you through a process. I'm eliminating things in your life that don't belong. And I'm elevating things in your life that do belong. Can somebody help me today? This is because the God who loves us, the God who created us, the God who knows us better than we know ourselves, he wants to redeem everything in our life, not just for our good, but for his glory. Let me ask you this. What are the things that are happening in your life? What's a part of your life right now that's not bearing any fruit? What are the things that you need to eliminate? What is God trying to subtract from you so he can increase other things inside of you? The threshing floor is the process. Really, there's a word. uh, There's a big spiritual word called sanctification. How many's heard that word before? Don't be intimidated by that word, but we used to hear that preached all the time. Sanctification. You're saved when you say yes to Jesus, but then sanctification is just a big word that talks about the process of becoming more like Christ. How many of you know we're not where we used to be, but we may not be where we want to be? None of us came to Jesus ready-made. You are a work in progress. I am a work in progress. I say yes to Jesus and his spirit enters into my life. And now God's got to deal with Mike Heyman about some things that don't belong. Are you with me today? You see, the longer I serve Jesus, the more I should look like Jesus. The more I should think like Jesus. The more I should act like Jesus. You know, if we've been walking with the Lord for a long time, our lives ought to start bearing fruit that resembles the master that we serve. It's funny, I heard a story recently. A mother was making pancakes for her two young boys. Billy and Ryan. Billy was the older brother. Ryan was the younger brother. And she's making pancakes, and the boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake. And so the mother had to kind of calm things down. You know, Ryan and Billy are fighting and fussing who's getting the first pancake. And Mama says, well, you know, if Jesus were here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Billy said, okay, Ryan, you be Jesus today. (laughs) How many know we can't delegate that to somebody else? When we say yes to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is going to bring us through a refining process. What does he begin to thresh out of our lives? Sinful habits, selfishness, idolatry, the things that we exalt before God, the priorities of our life that don't match the priorities of Scripture. It's kind of like this process of refining gold. It's it's interesting. There's a similarity between threshing and this refining of gold. First of all, what you would do, you'd take gold and you would crush it and you would grind it into powder. Then you would mix this substance called flux, mixing that in with the crushed particles of gold. Then you would melt it in a furnace. You would turn up the heat and melt that mixture. And the gold would stay at the bottom and all the alloys and impurities would surface to the top. And the refiner would scrape off all of those alloys, all of those foreign metals, and repeat this process again and again. And the refiner of gold knew that the process was complete when he could look into that gold and see a perfect reflection of himself. Do you know God brings us through a refining process again and again and again? There's a crushing There's a mixture of the Holy Spirit. There's the furnace of affliction that God will bring us through. You say, God, why are you always dealing with me? Why are you always dealing with me? Have you ever prayed that? Man, I've been, I have prayed time. Lord, why don't you deal with him? Look at her. Look at how they act. Man, they're not doing it, right? Lord, why are you always dealing with me? And you know what the Lord has told me? Mike, you've asked me for a lot. Do you want it or not? How many of you want to be more like Jesus? 
uh, okay, if we say, Lord, we want to be more like you, then there's a threshing floor that God has for us. There's a mixture that God's trying to separate. He's trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. There's a crushing and a breaking and a separating. You know, there's a great word in the Bible. It's called repent. Somebody say repent. And now we don't hear a lot about repentance anymore. I don't know why. John the Baptist, when he came onto the scene, his, his message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. You know, sometimes that word gets a bad rap. You know, we kind of associate it with negative thoughts and feelings and angry street preachers who are on the corner with the finger of doom. Ah, repent. Ah. Can I tell you, repent is one of the most beautiful biblical words. It is full of hope and opportunity. The word repent means to turn. It means to change. You are not doomed or destined to fail. You can repent and say, man, I don't want to be a part of that lifestyle, those habits, that way of thinking. That friend group is bringing me the wrong direction. Come on, somebody. You can turn around and you can change. You can set your face toward the things of God and he can transform you. Listen, you may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. We're all a work in progress. Progress. Come on, somebody say, he's still working on me. Man, if you fall into sin, I mean, disobedience, selfishness, arrogance, jealousy, gossip, man, all of us are prone to sin. You know what we get to do? Every single day, we ought to bring ourselves to the threshing floor. Say, Lord, will you forgive me for that? Forgive me when I said that. Forgive me for how I acted like that. Forgive me for operating out of pride or lust or, or arrogance or selfishness. Lord, I don't want that to be a part of my life. Break that off of me and separate it from me. Somebody say, I did it. Say, I admit it. Say, I quit it. So forget it. That's the process of turning from your sins and trusting God to wash you and cleanse you. Threshing floors are all about God refining us. How many of you are thankful that he's still working on you? I, you know, I love the words to this song. Mia, she says, I thank you for the threshing floor because I'm nothing like I was before. Oh, that's so good. Number one, the threshing floor is a place of refinement. Number two, it's a place of provision. Somebody say provision. Now, in Ruth, the book of Ruth, I don't have time to teach all of this, but I want to give you some context. Ruth was a widow. She was a Moabite. She wasn't a Hebrew, part of God's chosen people. She was a Moabite, a foreigner. Her husband had died, uh, so she was a widow living with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Ruth and Naomi were barely surviving. They had no resources. There was a famine in the land. And so they were struggling just to get by. One of the famous threshing floors in all the Bible is found in the book of Ruth. The scripture shows us that Ruth was gleaning in a field that belonged to Boaz. I don't have time to break all this down, but Boaz was a kinsman redeemer. Ruth had nothing, but she's working in the... Yeah, I love, this is a great story. Because Ruth had gone through a lot of sorrow and suffering, yet she was still being faithful working in the field. Wasn't feeling sorry for herself, wasn't trying to blame anybody or point any fingers, but she's working in the field of this man named Boaz. Had no idea who he was or that he was related to her mother-in-law, Naomi. He was a kinsman redeemer. Naomi recognizes what's happening and she says, Ruth, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to take a bath. For real, I'm not making this up. You can read it. Ruth is four chapters. It's an amazing love story. It's got a little twist in there now. He, he, but, but Naomi says, Ruth, clean yourself up. You need to bathe. You need to put on some good smelling perfumes. Wear some nice clothes. You got to change this outfit here. This ain't going to do. I want you to clean up really nice. And then I want you to, at the threshing floor, you sit at the feet of Boaz. Just Sit at his feet. Sometimes you got to put yourself in the right position. 
if you're going to find the right person. Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. If you're saved, you're single, and you're searching today, come on, somebody. Don't find that Mr. Right. Or, I'm telling you, Mr. Right ain't going to be in the club. Come on, somebody. You ain't going to find Boaz in the club getting jiggy with it. Is that even a thing? <laughs> and I'm trying to filter about, uh, about a dozen things that are happening in my mind right now. You ain't going to find Boaz in the club. You're going to find your redeemer in the house of God. Some of you can't find the right person because you're not looking in the right place. Naomi says, clean yourself up, change your clothes, put on some perfume, place yourself at the feet of Boaz. Look what happens, Ruth 3.16. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, well, what happened? How did it go? Ruth told Naomi everything that Boaz had done for her, and she added, he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. Boaz is understanding what's happening in Ruth and in Naomi. They don't have very much, but Boaz has resource. He says, I don't want you to go home empty-handed. Let me tell you this. At the threshing floor, when you encounter God, you never leave empty-handed. God has promised to provide for you. Now listen, this is good news. In a, in a time when the economy is, 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 is rough and inflation is high and the dollar is being stretched and sometimes we see ourselves in lack, God says, at the threshing floor, I will give you everything you need. You'll never walk away empty-handed when you meet God. Somebody say, God will give me everything I need. To do what he's called me to do. There is no lack in God. Psalm 37, 18. I've been speaking this verse over our church since January. Psalm 37, 18. The Bible says, there's a great promise. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent. They will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. Now watch this. Verse 18. They will not, verse 19. They will not be disgraced in hard times. And even in famine, they'll have more than enough. I want you to know you serve the God of more than enough. Abraham knew him as Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide whatever you need. Now, I didn't say greed. I said need. God will supply everything that I need. The psalmist said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means lack. There is no lack in God. It, it, when, when you encounter God, you never walk away empty-handed. Whatever you feel like you lack, Jesus will make up for. He is more than enough. Look at the scripture Jesus said in Luke 11 verse 13. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Come on, moms, dads, grandparents, do we not take care of our kids? Do we tell our children not to worry? You don't have to worry about Pop-Tarts. I'm gonna make sure you got everything that you need. Leave that to me. And God tells us the same thing. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, having enough clothes to wear. Man, don't you know that your father, man, look at the fields, the, the, the lilies of the field, they're clothed. Man, look at the birds of the sky. Man, they don't labor, they don't toil, they don't spin. Your heavenly father cares for them. Won't he care for you? Oh, the threshing floor is where God refines us. He eliminates things that don't belong, but then he also supplies everything that we'll need. Oh, this is so good. So, I mean, think about this. If while we were sinners, think about it. When, when you weren't walking with God, when you were an enemy of the cross, man, when you, you were in your own darkness and your own rebellion, if we were sinners, while we were sinners, God would provide Jesus as a sacrifice for our salvation. How much more can we count on him to provide for us now that we are sons and daughters? If God would do all of that for you when you weren't even thinking about him, won't God care for you? Turn your name and say, don't worry. God's got you. The threshing floor, it's a place of 
refinement. Number two, it's a place of provision. Number three, it's a place of worship and sacrifice. Hear this. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3, there's another threshing floor. I wish I had time to give you the context of this. This would be good for you to go back and study. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, we read of a significant moment in the Old Testament that happened at the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Now, let me give you some context here. David is king, and he's a beloved king, but he made some poor decisions. How many know you can be a good person, and you can end up in a bad place with a few wrong choices? David ordered that a census be taken of the nation of Israel, and this grieved the Spirit of God. Uh, for reasons I don't have time to really unpack, but he's kind of trusting in his own military might. You know, he's counting everybody in his kingdom, and, and he's sinned against God, and so God is going to bring some correction. He's going to bring some punishment, some direction to King David and the people of Israel, and he gave him a choice. How many of you have ever gotten troubled by your parents, and they said, hey, you can pick your punishment? Well, God does this with David. It says, David, you can either, here's your, you choose, all right? You, you choose the, the consequences. It's either three years of fleeing from your enemies. It's either three months of, of well, wait, let, me say, let me get this right. Three years of famine, three months of fleeing from your enemies are three days of plague. Three years, three months, three days. What would you choose? Three days, just get it over with. Three days of plague, just 24, 40, 72 hours. Man, I can get through anything. Did you know in three days, 70,000 people died? See, there are consequences to our disobedience. And David, now, the Bible says that this, this angel of the Lord was uh, headed toward Jerusalem and was about right at the threshing floor of a man named Arana the Jebusite. And David sees this and he says, I need to make an altar and I need to sacrifice to God so the plague will stop. And the, Arana sees King David and offers to give him the threshing floor. I'll even give you the, the, the oxen to, to sacrifice. And David said, no, nope, I'm going to buy this floor because I can't offer something to God that has cost me nothing. It's not an offering to the Lord if it's not a sacrifice to you. David bought it. And it was the equivalent of about $500. He bought that threshing floor for $500 and then made sacrifices to God and the plague stopped. And look at what happens. So check this out, 2 Chronicles 3.1. So Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to David, his father. The temple was built on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. Isn't it interesting to me that God would choose to build a temple, the greatest temple on earth, a temple for his glory at the very spot that David had his worst failure? You don't think God can redeem your mistakes? You don't think God can take a bad thing and use it for good? The worst of David was met by the very best of God. And that was the very place that the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite was the very place that the temple would be built for the glory of God. I want you to know this. The third thing about a threshing floor, it's a place of worship and sacrifice. Can I tell you this? We need the presence of God. And man, when you're going through hard times, there's probably nothing better for you to do. I know you don't feel like it. I know emotionally and intellectually, it probably makes no sense. But we worship God based on who he is and not how we feel. I don't come to church on a... I'm, just be honest with you. Can, can, can the pastor make a few confessions this morning? <laughs> can I tell you, I, I'm not here on Sundays and... and it's not like every Sunday I feel great. Sometimes I'm at church by faith, not by feelings. Is this helping anybody? Sometimes I get up and get dressed and go to church, and it's not because I don't want to be with you, but sometimes I'm not in good space. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm battling things. Sometimes I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm not sure I got the energy for this. But I'm telling you there's not a single time that I've ever come to church and walked away disappointed. Because I didn't make that about how I felt, 
Lord, you're worthy on good days and you're worthy on bad days. God, when I feel like it and when I don't. The Bible says that there's a Greek word for worship, a Greek prefix that is actually the word mega. Y'all know what mega means? Mega means to make larger than anything else. It's the same word that in the scripture in Psalm 34 that says, come magnify the Lord with me. Mega means to make larger, to magnify God. When you and I worship God, it's not that our problems go away, but God just gets bigger. You know, worship doesn't eliminate problems. Worship gives you the ability to navigate through your problems. Because when you set your eyes on God, when you worship him, you're making him larger than that problem, that situation, that struggle, that adversity, whatever it is that's coming against you. And we need that threshing floor. Just as David, interesting to me how the cost of the threshing floor was $500. You know what the value of the temple was? $1.74 $1.74 billion. It's interesting how sacred, when you struggle and surrender to the Lord, how God is faithful to redeem it and use it not only for your good, but for his glory. The threshing floor is a place of worship and sacrifice. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up. I want to ask the, the team to come up here. Is, has this been helpful today? I would encourage you if, you, if you haven't downloaded this song, do it. Get it into your spirit. Let God begin to speak to you about what he wants to do in the threshing floor of your life. The last thing, number four, and let me wrap this up. The threshing floor is a place of divine encounter. Divine encounter. And without the, the, the time to really explain this, there's one more threshing floor that I wanted to at least put on your radar and let you study in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 6, story of a man named Gideon. Are you all familiar with who Gideon was? Read this, Judges 6 and 7 and 8. Read read this this week when you get a chance. The Bible says that at this particular time in Israel's history, the Midianites were oppressing the Israelites. And they were so mean, so cruel, that Gideon is threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press because he's trying to hide the grain from the enemy. I mean, the, the, the Midianites would totally take all of their food and leave the Israelites to starve. This had happened for seven years. And one day, Gideon is at the threshing floor and an angel of the Lord shows up. And in verse 12, the angel of the Lord says, Mighty hero, God is with you. Interesting. Gideon is hiding from the enemy, and God says, mighty hero. (laughs) Doesn't sound very heroic to me. Do you know that the Spirit of God will always speak to a man's potential? I believe at the threshing floor, God will speak to you at the level that he's created you and knows you to be. He will draw out your best even when you don't see it in yourself. And Gideon says, mighty hero, you've got the wrong number. If I'm so heroic, why have all these bad things happened to us? Where are all the miracles that our ancestors talked of? You know what the angel of the Lord does? He doesn't even answer the the, the man's question. He says, Gideon, go in the strength that you have. And God will give you the strength that you need. You see, if you... If you go with what you've got, you say, Mike, on a scale of 1 to 10, I feel like I'm about a 2. I don't know what number you would give yourself today. A scale of 1 to 10, what number would you give you? How are you doing right now? 1 to 10. If you say, Mike, I'm about a 2, guess what? you got to show up with the 2 and trust God for the 8. If you show up with what you have, God will show up with what he has. And I promise you, what he has is exactly what you need. You see, Gideon had a divine encounter at the threshing floor. And some of you need a divine encounter with God Almighty. 